Sparku, a breath to spark the human heart. G'day there friends and family. My name is Mark Philpot and welcome to this episode of the Baku podcast where I talk about the things that are inspiring me. It's been a little while between episodes and it probably would have been even longer except that a couple of weeks ago I had a tumble. I fell off an e-mountain bike at work, which is pretty cool that I get to say that. I fell off an e-mountain bike at work doing the job where I take young people out riding in the beautiful trails of the Yu Yangs and Anglesey here in Victoria. But I had a tumble, washed out, not doing anything spectacular, and drove my shoulder into the ground, which resulted in a, a fractured scapula. So I've been taking a little bit of time off, and as happens when we're injured, when we can't do our normal activities, our habitual daily routines, I've had a little bit of extra time to stop and reflect and to reflect on what's inspiring me at the moment. So I'd like to share a little reflection with you. It's about Datsuns, it's about secret sentences, and it's about an ancient Sanskrit term called Sankalpa. So if you know me or you've heard a couple of the podcast episodes, the old Datsun 1600 comes up quite frequently. And every time I see one, my heart pines just a little bit for the one that got away. My little white rocket, KYM858, that I sold to buy a more sensible car in my early 20s when I became a youth pastor. And part of my job required driving young people around to different activities. And the old 1600, which was then 30 years old, rusted and had a turbocharged engine in it, probably wasn't the safest or most responsible choice. And apart from the one or two Datsuns that come down to the Rotary Club car show on the foreshore here in Torquay each year, I don't see a lot of these great little cars around anymore. And considering the 1600 or the Datsun 510 as they're known in the US was only produced between 1967 and 1973, making the latest models nearly half a century old. After 50 years, it's little wonder that there aren't many of these cars left on the road. And in particular, due to their reputation as an excellent race and rally car, we can imagine that a large number of Datsun 1600s were scrapped after high speed entanglements with state forest foliage or close encounters with trackside concrete barriers. But thanks to the internet and the rise of affordable videography equipment, from time to time, Datsun enthusiasts such as myself can take a few moments to appreciate some of the best examples of the Datsun 1600 from around the world. The ones that have survived the wreckers, the ones that have survived the crazy antics of various races and enthusiasts, and these ones have been restored, quite often not only to their former glory, but often to a degree of excellence that far surpasses the manufacturer's original offerings. One such example that's caught my eye recently on an episode of Hoonigan Autofocus, which involves Larry Chen spending time with owners of some beautifully restored cars, taking them for a drive and then capturing the owner's reflections on the build process and their relationship with their machine. But this particular episode that caught my attention was of Daniel Wu who is a famous actor from Hong Kong who's made many, many TV series and movies, none of which I've actually seen, but I liked him in this episode of Autofocus. And this episode showcases Daniel Wu's Datsun 510, which is a cool choice for a famous movie star. His little bluish gray Datsun is an absolute masterpiece. It's aesthetically and sonically beautiful. It comes together as a clean and coherent whole. Which started me thinking, what is it that distinguishes a successful creative project like Daniel's Little 510 from one that ends up languishing in the wrecker's yard or being crushed into a small cube of scrap metal? What's the special source, the key ingredient that sets Daniel's car apart 
from the unfortunate victim of my own adventures into car modification. To begin with, I wondered if there were some key differences between Daniel Wu and myself as the creators. What distinguishes one from the other? Now let's see. Daniel is an incredibly stylish, handsome movie star with chiseled abs who grew up on a skateboard where he first discovered the Datsun 1600. Pretty cool. Could the difference then be attributed to the fact that I'm not yet a famous movie star? No, I suspect that there's a little more to it. See, when I stopped and paid attention and I reflected, there was one key factor that distinguished the fate of our two Datsuns. A key factor that plays an integral role in the success of any creative project. From building a car to writing a book, recording a song or painting a canvas, even starting a business or operating an institution such as a school or a hospital. A key factor that I was missing as a 19 year old, but I'm becoming more and more acutely aware of as life rolls on. So to highlight the significance of this one simple, easy to implement, yet often overlooked factor, let's first wind the clock back 20 years to 2004 and my little white Datsun 1600. Now I can only assume that after I parted ways with my 1600, it has joined many of its quietly rusting peers and probably been turned into scrap metal. Why this unfortunate demise? Well, you see, as an exuberant 19 year old, the modification of my little car was well, it was rough at best. Following the example of the car culture at the time, the transplant of a 1.8 litre turbocharged twin cam engine from a 90s Nissan Silvia was conducted with all of the grace and precision of a chainsaw massacre. The angle grinder became my best friend and any existing part of the car that interfered with my goal was promptly cut off to make way for the more powerful, considerably larger engine with all of the auxiliary intercooler and turbo related paraphernalia that was required to make the thing work. As a 19 year old, I was concerned with very little apart from making the car as fast, as loud and as low as possible. And it was all of these three things. It was very fast, it was very low and it was very loud. but I didn't accomplish this goal with much finesse. Rather than approaching the project as an integrated whole, my Datsun had an array of parts simply thrown at it, a Frankenstein-like mishmash of mismatched parts. The combination of elements reflected the chaotic, manic thinking of a mad professor, which is a stark contrast to the balance and beauty of a well-designed project such as Daniel Wu's 510. Which brings us to our secret ingredient, Sankalpa. Now, what is it? Over the last couple of years, I completed meditation teacher training and I came across this Sanskrit word, Sankalpa. San meaning with, complete or whole and Kalpa meaning highest truth or deepest aspiration. Sankalpa, therefore, we can say means something like to be in accordance with our deepest aspiration or our highest truth. In the absence of a Sankalpa, we end up running off in all sorts of different directions with no sense of connection between the various parts of our lives, leading to sort of disconnected activities. And this lack of connectivity leads to a life of distraction. In one of his books, The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield gives the example of the young person who drives around in a lowered Supra with a subwoofer and a big exhaust as an illustration of the distracted life. An example of seeking attention in the wrong way by projecting our image onto things in a way that serves our ego, by screaming to the world, look at me. Pressfield sees this as a misdirection of energy to protect the self image and ultimately as a distraction from doing our creative work. Sounds a lot like my earlier foray into car modification. 
And ever since reading this, I've often wondered what this means for the world of car enthusiasts. Surely there were exceptions to this illustration, to this rule. For some people, tuning cars, turning them into works of automotive art is the creative work. Guys like Magnus Walker or, or Singer in the Porsche world immediately come to mind. But it wasn't a Porsche, instead it was the humble Datsun that helped me to see clearly that even a modified car could be the work for some creative people. But only if this secret ingredient was present. The defining factor that sets Daniel Wu's car apart from the many discarded examples languishing in scrapyards is that Daniel took the time to contemplate the vehicle and its highest aspiration before taking to it with an angle grinder. Rather than starting with what he wanted the car to be, fast, loud and low, Daniel started with the question, what does this car want to be? How is this car emerging and evolving? Daniel describes the moment as he was observing the vehicle and the name Tanto emerged. Tanto was prompted by the fold in the rear quarter panel pointing down towards the rear tail light, which Daniel thought looked just like the fold on the blade of the Tanto sword, carried by Japanese samurais. The name was already in the car. Daniel just took the time to observe it and name it. Tanto became the Sankalpa for the project, for the build, the highest truth and the deepest aspiration for the little Japanese sports sedan, guiding each stylistic choice. Everything that was to be included and excluded came back to this name. Tanto, as Daniel explains it, in the autofocus episode is a small Japanese sword, a bit like the samurai's katana, only much smaller and shorter, like a little dagger. And while it's shorter and smaller, it's equally as deadly as the katana. And this of course reflects the relationship between the Datsun 1600 and its larger stablemate, the six cylinder Skyline. And while the Datsun wasn't intended to be a race car, it turned out to be just as handy on the track. This name, Tante, carried all of the attributes of Daniel's vision for the build. It had Japanese heritage. It was small and deadly, compact, sharp, refined and beautiful. It set the feel and the tone for the entire project. And when a project starts with a coherent vision, a highest truth in mind, the outcome is something that can stand the test of time. It will feel right for many years to come. It's sustainable and it has longevity. It keeps on giving. So what about beyond restoring classic cars? How does this connect, this idea of Sankalpa? How does it feel in other areas of life? A couple of key points to keep in mind is that the Sankalpa emerges. It's not projected, it's not a manufacturing of the mind. It's something that's been there all along like the fold in the rear quarter panel of the Datsun 1600, or a seed planted in the ground. When we see it and name it, it feels true, but we have to wait for that moment to emerge. But when it does, there's a resonance in your body, in your heart, your mind, and your gut that knows that this is right. It's not a should, or it's not something that's done out of obligation, it's actually exciting. Sometimes it is scary, but there's a sense that if the obstacles were removed, it would lead to an awesome outcome. And the Sankalpa holds the entire creation together. It guides all the priorities, decisions about what's included and what's left out. So that as obstacles arise, the Sankalpa, the Sankalpa guides the way like a light in the dark. And it has relevance to discrete projects as much as it does to, to, our, to our more general project of the way we live our lives. So how do we discover the Sankalpa for a particular creative work or more generally for our lives? What holds us together? And I believe this, this is probably simplified into two parts. The first part is the active phase of thinking and contemplation. And the second phase is more passive and it just requires being still and open 
while we wait for the truth to emerge. So the first stage, the thinking, the active contemplation stage, This is a good time of year to be doing this, you see, this opportunity now that we're in before Christmas, before a lot of people take a break and spend some time relaxing, allowing their mind to slow down and, and chill out for a while. Now's an excellent time to start considering what could be the Sankalpa for the next chapter in our lives. Austin Kleon, the author of books such as Steal Like an Artist and Show Your Work, I recently heard him talking about the secret sentence that governs each of his creations. He starts by creating them using a framework that jolts the imagination into life. He says it can be really fun to consider. Well, what would this be like if artist X did this project? What would it be like if Ed Sheeran wrote the romance novel or Missy Higgins opened the school? But why stop there? Once we've identified who's doing the project and what the project is, why not consider some other constraints, such as when this project will happen or where it's happening? What if Ed Sheeran wrote a romance novel 10 years from now while living in Australia? What would that sound like? And I'm not writing a no romance novel, I just find it's a fun example. Now, after we've given our Sankalpa some conscious consideration, the second part of the process is more passive. We put down the abundance of ideas that have emerged and we take a step back. We go and we do other things. We spend time with family, we sit on the beach, we go for some long walks and bike rides, we go for a surf. And that's the time when we are allowing the Sankalpa to emerge. It's a bit like tilling compost into the soil, the first part. We see what ideas are there and we give them a good mix up. And the second phase is more like just waiting for nature to do its thing. Simply adopting the disposition of being open and receptive, allowing the Sankalpa to emerge. And it could be specific to a project or more generally for the next chapter in life. We wait for that moment of aha or the illumination to hit us. And when a person, a project or a group is aware of the Sankalpa, it creates a power shift. The group has the advantage or the individual has the advantage of being led from the center. The power to move forward comes from within rather than being directed by external forces. There's a shift from external motivation and coercion, the pride and shame game, the reward and punishment game, to an intrinsic sense of motivation. The action becomes a reflection of our highest truth and our deepest aspiration. Our role as creative participants in our lives is to pay attention to what's there, to name it, make the implicit explicit, and then remain faithful to that Sankalpa throughout the creative process. The result is work that has a wholeness and integrity to it. It's sustainable and it's beautiful. Where all the parts fit together and the outcome becomes valuable for years to come, just like Tanto. So this holiday season, take a minute to save your dreams from the angle grinder. Pause and reflect. Ask yourself, what is the highest truth or deepest aspiration for the next season in life? And then we wait, we eat some cake, and we see what emerges. Until next time, I wish you all the best. Baku.